making application monitoring work for you. Um, and so we want to be specific about what monitoring means. Monitoring, uh, to, to, to monitor something, <laughs> uh, we, we really mean you're getting alerts on it, right? You're, uh, you're getting alerted to when something goes wrong. Otherwise, New Relic is just a diagnostics tool. You're going in, you're fixing a problem, but then sometime later the problem will pop back up again. You're not, you're not alerted in time. And so uh, we're going to talk about ways to, uh, to make sure, oops, sorry, safe harbor slide, uh, to make sure that you're using all of the core features of APM uh, to make sure you're staying ahead of problems uh, and, and turning your organizations from a reactive organization, reacting to problems as they come, uh, and, being, and being more proactive. It's going to help you uh, achieve that transition. So before we get started, uh, safe harbor slide, uh, lots of text. Legalese, internalize it as fast as you can. Um, this is another hands-on lab. If you were in a previous session, you already have uh, you already have access to the account. If you don't have access to the account, I'll help you out uh, through this session. Uh, the composition of the session will be we'll, we'll focus on three things primarily. Uh, I'll go through key transactions uh, and specifically key transactions for business critical code. That's what they're it's what it's intended for. Uh, AppDex application performance index. Oh, thanks. Um, and alerts, alerting, and just the, the idea, the concept of alert fatigue. Uh, avoiding that alert fatigue within your organization. So we'll just we'll touch briefly on that. Um, and so I'll do that for about 15, 20 minutes, uh, go through these topics, and then uh, we'll open it up uh, to, to give you access to the demonstration accounts. Everyone is an admin. Uh, security's mind has has been blown, but everyone's an admin, so you can, uh, you can create alert conditions, uh, you can do things. The only thing I ask you to do, uh, to not do, is like uh, delete applications, which you shouldn't be able to do anyway without uh, stopping uh, the data flow. So um, I'm gonna get out of this presentation and go directly uh, into, into the product. And we'll come back for a couple of slides for, for AppDex, but uh, let's get dive right into key transactions. Okay, so a key transaction, what, what, is, what is a key transaction fundamentally? It's, it's, it's a transaction, it's an end-to-end -end path through your code that is very important to you. Uh, traditionally, this means uh, parts of your code that makes you money, right? So you, you definitely want to, to pay attention to those types of transactions. So we're talking about uh, checkout processes, uh, if, you're, if you're doing e-commerce. Basically, the main, the main functionality for that service or for that application, you should probably be monitoring with the key transaction. Uh, and so what that allows you to, to do, instead of getting a high-level uh, idea of or a high-level alert on your application or your service when something's going wrong, you can very narrowly focus on a, a very specific slice. And so you can kind of get ahead uh, of problems as they as they start developing, and so let's let's kind of uh, investigate how to do that. So we'll we'll go through this. Oh my God, we're not looking at anything. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. There we go. Okay. So we're back in APM. We're looking at the overview. We have some we have some transactions here. And so if you were in the previous sessions, one of our uh, troubleshooting workflows is uh, changing this web transaction response time graph from uh, this aggregated uh, graph to a histogram. And this, what this does, it'll, in this case, uh, we're not getting much, much information because all, uh, all of the events are, are falling into one bucket. But if we go to, say, the order service, and we'll just run through this really quickly for those of us that, that didn't attend before. You can see here that a vast majority of our, our transactions are happening very, very quickly, but we have a long tail, right? We have, we have some problematic transactions here. We can click on them, we can identify uh, which transactions those are, and then we can go there. So we kind of went through this, this troubleshooting procedure, but we want to monitor these. We don't want to simply uh, have to come back and continually assess the health of this of this transaction, right? This is this is business critical. Probably somewhere down the line, uh, we may want to revisit this. And so, 
up here in the top, uh, if it's not already a, a key transaction, you'll, you'll see a add to key transaction button. And in this case, uh, a key transaction already exists for this particular transaction. And so I can click on it. This will take me to that uh, particular transactions dashboard. And you'll see that it, basically you get a, a, a dedicated overview. You have a, a dedicated um, area for, for, to, to investigate this, this transaction and all the segments that, that uh, comprise that, that transaction. And so um, here you have the ability, just like, uh, just like the, over, the, the overview for your application, you can click on, on these, identify which, uh, which segments are, are problematic. Uh, you have an individual AppDeck score. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. You have an AppDeck score specific to this key transaction. This really allows you to differentiate between parts of an application. So if you're, if you're using a, a kind of a more monolithic architecture, you have a wide variety of transactions happening within an application. Some are very fast, some are very slow. And so an AppDeck score that's, that's very broad uh, may not alert you in time, right? Uh, you have different, you have different uh, thresholds for, for each of these. And so uh, key transactions have their own AppDeck scores. We'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, you have throughput, error rate details, and transaction traces for, for that particular transaction. But some of the more useful, uh, more useful features, and I think in particular, I like uh, the X-ray feature. This is, uh, this is available, uh, not, I don't think it's available for all of our agents right now, but what the X-ray session essentially allows you to do is to isolate this transaction and collect transaction traces over a specified period of time. And so you can really focus uh, in on a transaction, whether it's production or in your staging environment. And if you know that there's problems, you don't have to rely on traffic, uh, you know, uh, on, on, on bad traffic meeting your threshold. You can get more transaction traces. This is particularly uh, useful for, for problems that don't recur regularly, right? Uh, if you have those, the, these classes of bugs that, that occur infrequently, they occur only under certain conditions, this might allow you to, to find those bugs more easily, right? And so here you have the ability uh, to name a session just for, for your own uh, benefit and select uh, a range between 10 and 100 uh, transaction traces taken, taken during this time. In addition to, to taking uh, whatever traces you select, it's also going to run a thread profiling session for this transaction. So if you're not familiar with the thread profiler, we can go, we've got one saved in here. And again, this, is, this isn't available for all of the agents. Uh, check the documentation to make sure it's available. Uh, for yours, but the thread profiler is going to give you really, really granular visibility uh, into your transaction. It will go through the entire stack trace. Uh, it'll, it'll run through that, and this is what it looks like once it loads. There it is. So. Uh, our thread profiler, uh, uh, you have a tree uh, that you can change the orientation. In this case, we're looking at a top-down view. And so uh, in order to, to find uh, the specific problem, we're going to need to drill down uh, into these red areas here. So we're, we're drilling down, and we found that 74% of all time being spent in this particular uh, thread profiling session was, uh, was spent with, uh, with this particular uh, function here, which appears to be uh, a, an issue with, uh, with Java in this case. So, um, so for those really in-depth problems, the trickiest problems, x-ray sessions and, and thread profiling can really uh, help you assess what the, what the issue is. So let's move on to uh, AppDex. And I'm going to go back to the presentation, if I can find my mouse. 
And AppDex has been mentioned before, and AppDex stands for Application Performance Index, and it's a way that we've come up with, along with a variety of other companies, to try and quantify the user's experience. Um, before AppDex or, or a figure like this, you could, you can combine measurements of throughput, you can get, um, you can get response time, but raw response time doesn't necessarily give you context. Uh, throughput doesn't really give you, give you context. And so uh, what AppDex does is kind of, it, it adds these uh, metrics together uh, in a way that we think um, captures what a user is feeling, right? And so this is essentially what it looks like. Uh, an HTTP request comes in. What did I just, what the hell just happened? <laughs> I think I pressed X, okay. Uh, a request comes in, and we're, we're measuring that request, right? Like we're measuring all of, all of our requests. We're, we're seeing how long it takes. And we're filtering all of these requests on a threshold. This threshold is called AppDex T, okay? And this is, this is the, uh, the setting that you're gonna be configuring uh, in your application settings. And so AppDex, uh, AppDex exists uh, at the application level. Each application has its own AppDex score. And so if you're familiar with the term alert fatigue, uh, I like to talk a little bit about AppDex fatigue. And one of the major complaints about AppDex is that you actually have to set AppDex T yourself. And the reason for this is because uh, each application is different. Your expectations for that application are different. Uh, your customer's expectations for that application is different. Uh, you may have uh, an SLA for, you know, from service to service, and so we try, you, you try to, uh, uh, to be specific about, about your thresholds. Um, and some people take that as, you need to set AppDex for all of your applications. And that's quickly gonna burn you out, especially if, if you're in like a service-oriented architecture. Um, you don't wanna be updating AppDex for 100 applications. And so I highly recommend uh, setting AppDex for your most business-critical apps, your most business-critical key transactions. That's, that's gonna be the most effective way to leverage AppDex, and I'll, I'll show you why. So it filters, uh, it filters on AppDex T. And it filters it into three different buckets. First, you have the satisfied bucket. This is any uh, request that comes in uh, at or below the threshold. A tolerated request, a tolerating request is anything that comes in over that threshold. And then a frustrated request is any request that comes in four times the threshold that you set. Why is it four times? I don't know. It seemed like a really good number. They tested it. it, it it's worked, right? So uh, four times the threshold is frustrated. We don't know how science works. Um, <laughs> errors are also included into this bucket. And so all of those, uh, all of those messages will be, will be put into frustrated bucket. And so really briefly, uh, this is how that's get, that gets calculated. You take the number of satisfied requests, you add it to the number of tolerated requests divided by two. So tolerating requests get half, half a point essentially and then you divide that by the total number of requests. So notice that we, we just kind of throw out all the frustrated requests. They don't add to our score. Um, they're, they're net negative effect. So AppDex ranges anywhere from zero to one. And let's go into, did you get that? I think I closed the slide, cool. <laughs> I wanted to make sure you got it. There we go. So, if we go back to our applications, and let's look at let's look at the order service. Actually, I'll look at storefront. I'll look at the storefront service. Just move this to the response time view. So if you look at the AppDex score uh, section here, you get, a nice, uh, you get a nice explanation of what AppDex is. And it's important also to note that we have an end user AppDex threshold and a browser AppDex threshold. So uh, the browser AppDex threshold is automatically gonna be applied 
uh, to applications that are monitored with browser. And this is important because um, there's a difference. There's a difference between our expectations on the server side and what happens beyond the server. Uh, a lot of that sometimes is beyond our control, right? And so that, that allows us to identify whether, uh, you know, whether we have issues with the CDN, whether uh, there's some strange networking uh, problems coming up, and it, it differentiates between uh, the client side and the server side. So we do both. And uh, we also include those end user app tech scores uh, in APM. You, you can go from APM to browser very quickly just by, uh, just by either clicking on, on this AppDeck score here or clicking on uh, this browser response time, and it'll, it'll send you directly to that connected application. So if we hover over the AppDeck score, we can see that uh, we can see the sample size. In this case, we're looking at a one minute period, uh, and we see we have 100 uh, requests that have come in, and this is we're looking at end user. 74% of those requests were satisfactory requests, 26% uh, were, were tolerating it. So you can see how, how the score uh, changes overall. We don't have any frustrated requests, and so uh, because of that, we won't necessarily have any transaction traces. So uh, that's another important thing to, to understand. Transaction traces, by default, are tied to AppDex F. Any frustrated uh, transaction is going to have a transaction trace associated with it, right? And so this is, this is also an important part of, of uh, making sure you have your AppDex score set. Uh, because if you don't have it set uh, to a correct level, you may not be getting the transaction traces that you need uh, to troubleshoot your issues. So, so make sure that's set. Uh, if you want to change that, we can go into the application settings, scroll down here, go into application. And here you see that we've actually changed it from the default setting, AppDex, uh, excuse me, this is, I was looking at the wrong thing. Uh, we haven't changed it in this case. The threshold for transaction tracing is still uh, AppDex F, but you can change it to, to anything else that you'd like. In this case, we've made the aptX T very low. So uh, in this case, our aptX F would be 0 0.084 milliseconds. OK? So this, this essentially guarantees that we're going to get a transaction trace on as many transactions as possible, because we've set this very, very low. Uh, you can do that. You can do that as well, especially if you're in, in kind of like, a, like a, a debugging mindset or if you're in staging, uh, something like that. You can set your threshold really low, get a bunch of transactions, uh, but you may not want to do that uh, in, a, in a production environment. It's not going to hurt anything, but it, it may increase uh, uh, memory consumption marginally for the agent. Um. OK. So what, what is a reasonable AppTech score? Well, that depends on your app application. So uh, if we go to the Storefront app, What we're looking for is a representative time period. Uh, and so in this case, three hours is probably a little bit too short. I like to go and look at the seven-day window. And it depends on your app. If you see, if you see a big reduction in traffic over the weekend, um, you may uh, want to, uh, to reduce your window. Uh, to a five-day period during the day. That, that may be more representative. Um, and you know, if you're not perfectly scalable, the more throughput you have, the longer it, it usually takes for, for transactions to process, right? Um, you're going to have longer uh, response times. It depends, on, it depends on the language and framework you're using. But uh, try and get a representative time. Uh, we make it pretty easy because we give you the average Right here. So this is your average uh, transaction response time over this particular time window. In this case, it's uh, 20 milliseconds. So this is uh, this is basically what you want to set your threshold around. You may want to set it a little bit lower than this. 
uh, if you want to be uh, more sensitive. Uh, if you want less false positives, you might set it a little bit higher. But this will give you, uh, generally speaking, a, a, a pretty, decent, pretty decent threshold for, for AppDex. So um, now we can move from, from AppDex. Uh, well, actually, I want to mention one, one last thing. We mentioned before that uh, key transactions have their own AppDex score. And so what happens when you, when you assign a new uh, threshold to a key transaction, it'll actually combine those scores with an application. So you'll have your overall application AppDex score, and then you'll have your little constituent component key transaction AppDexes, and then it'll, it'll give you uh, kind of like a generalized score. Uh, I'm not sure what the formula is exactly, but uh, essentially it'll, uh, it'll kind of normalize it for you. And, and this AppDex score will be a combination of all of those. So let's go into, let's go into alerts. And let's create some conditions and tie those conditions to AppDex and see what we come up with. Okay. So this is, uh, this is new alerts, newer for some of you, older uh, for some of you. Uh, it's been around a while, um, but uh, we're very, very excited to, uh, to release a bunch of new features surrounding alerts today. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about those in addition uh, to talking about setting conditions. So alerts at New Relic are based on policies. Policies are containers for uh, uh, conditions and notification channels. So this is, I didn't actually mean to click on this particular incident, but we'll, we'll discuss it anyway. Uh, when a condition within a policy is triggered, it creates an incident, okay? And within, uh, and how many incidents you actually get is, is controlled by a, another setting. So if we go into our alert policies, this shows us all of the policies that, that exist here. Uh, and we can actually go ahead and create a new policy. Marco's policy. And we have something called incident preference. And this is where uh, the idea of alert fatigue comes in. Our default is by policy. And so no matter how many conditions, how many channels you have on your policy, it's only going to create one incident per policy. You're only going to get one notification for this policy. So no matter how many, how many things are triggered, you can change that behavior by selecting by condition or by condition and entity. If you have a lot of conditions within a policy and you have a lot of entities, if you're running uh, things on uh, 150, 300 different hosts, uh, et cetera, you're gonna get a lot of notifications. And so for larger organizations, if you're, if you're running uh, uh, a big architecture, you may want to consider keeping it on, on by policy. If you, have, uh, if you have very specific needs by condition and by condition and entity, may work for you. But uh, what we try to, uh, to consult people uh, into avoiding is alert fatigue. Don't, don't set your thresholds too low. Don't set your conditions too low. You'll begin to, to ignore, uh, ignore these things. And that's, uh, that's what drives companies into, into trouble. OK? So that's, that's kind of our, our philosophy uh, in general. We want to make every incident and every notification actionable. You shouldn't, you shouldn't ignore any notification because if, if it kind of defeats the purpose. So I want to harp on that uh, too much anymore. So uh, when creating policies, one of the first things I like to do is actually set up my notification channels. Um, if you click here on the notification channels tab, this isn't actually where you add notification channels. This is where you add notification channels to a policy, notification channels that already exist. If you want to add notification channels to your account, you add them up here. So this is the sub-navigation menu. 
notification channels. This controls uh, all of the channels that are available to you. If you want to add new channels, you, you simply cl uh, click on the new notification channel button up here in the top right. Brings you to the channel details. And then we have a variety of channel types that, that you can use. Right? right now we have integrations with Campfire, email, uh, HipChat, OpsGenie, PagerDuty, uh, et cetera, Webhook. Um, and if we don't have your specific integration, Webhook may solve the, the problem for you. So let's, let's actually create uh, a webhook channel. We'll call it my hook. And we'll get a, web, uh, a base URL. So um, I like to use a little site called request, request bin. So request bin allows you to inspect HTTP requests. And it actually allows you to test channels. This is a great way. Uh, to, to kind of create a, a test scenario for yourself uh, if you want to uh, if you want to test the webhook capability so it's it's really easy you simply create a bin it'll give you a URL and now you can copy this URL put it back into alerts and paste it into this base this base URL here right and so when this notification channel gets triggered it's going to send uh, it's going to send a message to that uh, to that bin, and you'll be able to inspect that uh, that message's contents. So this is particularly useful uh, if you have an integration that you're that you're working on. You want to make sure your, uh, your your JSON is properly uh, properly formatted, or your XML is properly formatted. So that's that's a good way to to check on that. Uh, in addition, uh, we also have the ability to to do basic authentication. Uh, you can add custom headers. So if you need an API key uh, or you have some other sort of uh, authorization key that you need to, to, to pass to that endpoint, you can do that here. One really interesting use case we've seen is actually kind of a meta New Relic uh, use case where uh, you can use the insights endpoint, add your insights insertion key here in the custom headers, and now anytime an alert gets fired, that alert message will also get sent to insights. And so now you can actually track and, and take a look at all of the alerts that, you've, that you uh, have created. You can filter through those alerts, you can filter through those messaging and kind of understand, get, capture uh, kind of a meta view for, for what types of things are coming up more often. So that's, uh, that's an interesting use case for, for webhooks. If you wanna learn more about that, we can do, uh, we can talk about that after the session. I'll show you how that works. So uh, in addition, you can add, uh, add a custom payload here. So uh, in that insights example, this is where you would add like an event type uh, that maybe says, uh, you know, NR alerts or something like that, that distinguishes this, this payload. Or uh, whatever uh, payload requirements you need for whatever integration you're trying to hook into with alerts. Okay? So um, in general, set up your notification channels, uh, set up a test channel, apply that test channel to your policies, make sure your policies are working before, before you, you let, loose, let loose in production. Um, you definitely don't want to like turn, turn it on and then get a million, a million notifications across your organization. That's, that's not fun for anyone. So uh, beyond your channels, if we go into our policies, let's talk about adding specific conditions. So we've got a lot of new, uh, new options here. Um, we have the, the ability to scope uh, to either our application or in the case of Java, uh, individual uh, Java application instances, that is uh, each individual JVM um, for APM. Uh, APM allows you to alert on metrics, on uh, metric baselines. This is, a, this is a new feature we'll look into in just a little bit. You have uh, uh, JVM health metrics, uh, key transaction metrics, this is where key transactions come in, uh, and web transaction percentiles. And of course, external services. You can um, if you have 
uh, external services reporting to your application, you can you can monitor those with with custom uh, custom metrics. So let's look at application metric baselining really quick, and I'll come back and and talk about browser servers uh, and the rest and those capabilities. So once we select uh, the category and the, the component that, that we want to monitor, we're gonna select the entities that we want to monitor. So uh, in this case, these are all the applications that, uh, that exist within this account, okay? So I'll just select just a couple here. And now we can go and actually define thresholds for these conditions. So with uh, application metric baselining, you select your target metric. Uh, so transaction time, throughput, database time, uh, external services, et cetera. You select your metric. And then instead of selecting a, a specific response time or app deck score or something like that, you give it a baseline. And you can adjust the threshold on this baseline by using this, this toggle here. And so in this case, we have, we have a pretty, pretty high threshold, so we need to bring it down a while here to get kind of an accurate view. So maybe this wasn't the best the best example. Let's go to another service. Baselining works best if you're targeting specific entities uh, because those, those entities won't be, uh, entities can be radically, radically different. So actually this is, a, this is a little bit better example. So as you, as you adjust uh, this, this threshold, you'll see that background gray and that, that basically uh, tells you how many, uh, how many critical violations you would have uh, seen within that time period. And we have two time periods to select. Right now, uh, right now we have the last two days or the last seven days. Kind of arbitrary at this point, but we're adding additional, uh, additional functionality there. It's pretty much a, a scalability issue. So uh, in this case, you can see that we've got some alert conditions that are, that are popping, these red lines that are going beyond the threshold. This is, this is what will trigger a, a critical condition and therefore will send an actual alert to, uh, to your notification channels. I'm sorry? Nope, yeah, so if, if your transaction is too fast, I guess that's good. <laughs> you don't get an alert because it's 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 performing. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. That's actually that's a good point. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. So he's he's saying, um, if your transaction is too fast, will you will you get an alert? No, not not with uh, unless I'm unless I'm wrong here. But no, you won't. You wouldn't get an alert with, with this baseline. Oh no, no, yeah, you're right. You will. You will get an alert. I apologize. Yes. So, sorry about that, everyone. I don't mean to. Um, yes, this is the bottom range for the threshold. You will get an alert under these under these conditions. Absolutely right. Okay. So um, this is setting the, the, critical, uh, the critical alert window. You can add a warning threshold. Uh, warning thresholds don't actually send out alerts into your notification channels. Uh, warning thresholds are, are visual only, and, and those, will, uh, those will appear in your application overview. Um, so your list of applications, it'll appear on your, uh, on your events tab, uh, and it'll kind of give you an early an early warning for when your, your application is starting to, uh, starting to suffer. Okay. So let's go back, talk a little bit about some of the other products. 
So with browser, we have the ability to select metrics uh, and, and also do metric, uh, metric baselines. Uh, servers have metrics. Mobile, you have metrics and external services. Uh, plugins, whatever plugins you have attached to this particular account, you're going to be able to alert on specific uh, uh, metrics for those, for those plugins. Uh, synthetic failures um, are, are kind of self-explanatory. Self if your monitor fails, you'll get an alert sent for this particular uh, condition. And NRQL is, is, uh, is another new feature uh, that we have that allows you to uh, not make an arbitrary NRQL query. There are some restrictions. Uh, but this, this little, little tab gives you an idea of, of what types of questions you can ask. So this gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility uh, with your alerting. Uh, you can ask very, very specific questions of your, uh, of your application and your, your environment with, with NRQL alerts. Okay. So we've got, about, we've got about 10 minutes left. And so I've added everybody to, uh, to a training account. And I'm going to pull up a slide here. In just a moment. OK. So we actually used this account um, in a previous session for, for our workshop, for those of you that, uh, that, were, um, that attended the um, uh, introductory session earlier today. We also have a Slack channel that we've, uh, that we've set up. If you go to tinyurl, uh, enter you, sign up. Uh, that's going to be a permanent place for you uh, to ask questions. Uh, and then the NRU team will be monitoring those channels. It will be able to answer questions that you ask um, and, and kind of help, help, uh, help guide you as you, as you go through uh, some, of this, uh, some of our content. Um, so for those of you that, don't, uh, that weren't in the previous sessions, uh, you can access. You should have all been added. Uh, to this particular training account. If you haven't been added to the account, you can send me a message on Slack. Uh, you have admin access uh, to the account. You can create alerts, play with alert conditions, uh, kind of run through all these motions. And um, for the next couple days and essentially a week, uh, we'll be monitoring Slack. We'll be monitoring the future stack specific Slack channels. So as you're playing in these environments, whether or not you actually have an environment, uh, you know, that uh, if you're not a customer, um, this gives you the opportunity to play with all of these features for a little while uh, and ask questions. So let me know if you can't get into the accounts. Um, for the rest of this session, uh, I recommend just, just going into the account, taking a look at key transactions, uh, set some app deck scores. They might get reset by other people, uh, and uh, take a look at our, our new alerts uh, functionality. So this is kind of a, uh, an asynchronous mini workshop. We'll be, uh, we'll be talking about this over the next, next couple of days. So that's all I've got for you uh, today. We've got about uh, seven minutes left. Um, and so if you have any specific questions, I'll walk around, answer, answer those questions, and kind of guide you, uh, guide you through. If you want to stick around later, um, I'll, be, I'll be around. and. Uh, one thing I will note, I will be doing uh, another session of um, uh, how to get immediate value from APM. So if you weren't able to attend that particular session uh, earlier today, uh, this is the agenda for that. Can you go back to static? Thanks. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how New Relic works at a high level, solving problems with APM, getting a, a, a troubleshooting uh, methodology. In. Uh, troubleshooting and visibility with insights. It'll be an informal session. We'll probably do it around lunch, and I'll, uh, I'll have the details in the Slack channel uh, for that session for tomorrow. OK? That's all we've got. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Mark.